So our next session is entitled, What Happens in California Doesn't Stay in California. To lead us off and then moderate this session is Joel Perler. Joel is Assistant Business Development Manager at the Port of Long Beach. At the Port of Long Beach, Joel's responsibilities include promoting the port's facilities and services to current and prospective uh, containerized cargo experts promoting international trade and related economical, economic development activities at various trade events and conferences nationwide, and developing a variety of export-based learning seminars and training pro programs. It's been very busy, I can imagine, lately. So please welcome Joel to the stage. Thank you. Great to meet you. Yeah, you too. All right, thank you, Ben, and thank you to the Orange County Water District for inviting me here today. Thank you all to all of you for ditching work to be with us. Um, I know it's serious topics we're discussing, but I, I couldn't help being excited to be on stage at a, a Disney hotel. And I told my seven-year-old I was going to be presenting on stage at a Disney hotel, and he suggested I sing a song from Frozen. <laughs> I thought, well, there's a water connection there, but maybe I won't do that. So if you indulge me, I'm just going to give you a quick, uh, quick commercial for the Port of Long Beach, and then we'll get into our, our panel discussion. The Port of Long Beach is a premier U.S. gateway for trans-Pacific trade, served by more than 140 shipping lines with connections to 217 seaports around the world. With 450 employees, 3,200 acres of land, 35 miles of waterfront, and six container terminals, we are the second largest and busiest seaport in North America, behind our neighbor, the Port of Los Angeles. In 2014, the Port of Long Beach moved 6.8 million TEUs, those are the big metal containers that you see on ships, on the docks, on trucks, and everywhere over, all over the California freeways. And that's a 1.3% increase over 2013. It amounts to $180 billion worth of goods, and it marked the third busiest year in the port's history, and we've been open since 1911. The Port of Long Beach is a major, oops, I do? major economic force. We, have, we support 30,000 jobs in Long Beach alone, 316,000 jobs in Southern California, and 1.4 million jobs throughout the United States. We generate about $16 billion in annual trade-related wages statewide. Of course, if this drought continues, California ag exports will go down, and these numbers will be impacted. In fact, the export decline is already occurring. In 2013, we shipped five, excuse me, 600,000 TEUs of California ag products. In 2014, that number fell to 500,000, a drop of 16.5%. For perspective, our overall exports declined only 5.9% during that same period. And keep in mind, we are just one port in the state of California. There are 11 ports that are shipping out ag product. But we are still an import nation, and we are receiving record numbers of containers. To stay competitive, we are spending more than $4 billion this decade alone on massive infrastructure projects. That's a huge investment the biggest by any port in the country. These projects create 3,000 to 5,000 construction jobs, and many more will be added over time. The Middle Harbor project is our biggest at $1.3 billion. This fully automated 305-acre terminal will be one of the cleanest and most technologically advanced container terminals in the world. Its capacity will be 3 million TEUs with half the air emissions. At that output, if it were a port unto itself, it would be the fourth largest port in the country. We're also spending $1.2 million on the iconic Gerald Desmond Bridge, which carries 15% of all imports into the US. So that the bigger ships can reach our back channel, the bridge will be raised from 155 feet to 205 feet above the water. It'll also be expanded from four to six lanes with an emergency lane and bike path added. And that's good news for the thousands of commuters that also use this bridge every day. It'll be the largest cable state bridge west of the Mississippi and will generate about 4,000 construction jobs each year until it opens in 2018. On-dock rail is huge for the Port of Long Beach and the Port of Los Angeles. 
we're expanding our overall on-dock rail capacity from 23% to 35% at a cost of about $1 billion. More on-dock rail means less truck and terminal congestion, improved air quality, and it increases the speed in which we move containers through the port. We are the green port. That's our tagline. And this year we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of our green port policy. This policy is our commitment to a broad range of environmental initiatives that are now integrated into every aspect of port operations. We have collaborated successfully with the Port of Los Angeles to reduce pollutions from ships, trucks, trains, and tugs. Just one example of our green initiatives is the Clean Trucks Program, launched in 2008. And essentially what this is, is we have banned all of the pre-2007 trucks from working within the Twin Ports. As a result, since 2005, we have reduced all of the key air pollutants. Especially notable is the 82% reduction in diesel particulate emissions. Keep in mind, these declines have occurred even as we are moving much more cargo than we did 10 years ago. We continue to electrify our operations with both business and environmental benefits. But with automation, we could see a quadrupling of our energy use over the next couple of decades, with costs exceeding $100 million per year by the year 2030. And the grid is old. All of this will have an impact on our business continuity, the port's bottom line, and our operations. So our board of harbor commissioners approved an energy policy with the goals of reducing the port's reliance on limited national resources, being prepared for energy interruptions, and working with our customers to implement mutually beneficial energy saving programs. We talk about water at the Port of Long Beach, but in a different context than you might think. Water and sediment quality in our harbor used to be a big challenge, but has improved greatly over the last 40 years through increased monitoring, more aggressive regulation by state and federal agencies, better pollution source control, and dredging that has removed accumulated contaminants from the harbor. In 2009, our board approved the Water Resources Action Plan, or RAP. RAP is a planning document that supports programs promoting healthy water, as well as preventing port operations from degrading current existing water quality. And with that, I thank you, and now I'm going to introduce our panelists. First up is Paul Pereira. Paul is a partner at RPAC Almond Handlers and Growers. The Pereira family began farming on the west side of California's San Joaquin Valley in the late 1920s. They planted their first almonds in the 1950s. The Pereira family began holing and shelling California almonds in 1973 and continues to be an industry leader. RPAC was founded in 1986 to provide growers with more marketing options and supply buyers around the world with the best quality almonds. Their operations include farming, holing and shelling, processing, and exporting. Three generations later, the family continues to make a tremendous impact on our economy. Please welcome Paul Pereira. Thank you, Joel. Good morning. Um, first off, I'd like to thank all of you for the opportunity to come down and visit with you today. As Joel mentioned, uh, I'm a third generation farmer in the San Joaquin Valley. And before we talk about water a little bit, I'd like to talk about generational farmers such as ourselves. There are some, some staggering statistics out there that, uh, that make you wonder why we continue generation after generation to, 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 to work the soil and go through what we do to, to produce food and fiber for the world. Um, First of all, 91% of the farms in California, there's, there's a little under 82,000 farms, 81,700 farms in California, with an average uh, size of 311 acres. And 311 is kind of important because uh, less than 10 years ago, that number was 347 acres. So we can see that, that you know, we're, we're losing farm ground, uh, we're losing some farmers. But 91% of us are family farms and partnerships. So we're not losing the acres to the big, huge corporate farms that, that 
so many times we get bad press about that, that's inaccurate. So 91% of us are family farms. However, most of us are not third generation or fourth generation. The, uh, the chance of success from first generation family farm to second generation is only 33%. From second generation to third generation falls to just 17%. And when you try to go from third generation to fourth generation, it falls below 4% success rate. I've got a, a five-year-old grandson that is fifth generation farmer on both sides of his family. What do you think his chances are of succeeding as a fifth generation farmer and agriculturalist in California? So, so those are some of the things that we look at in our family. Um, my, my grandparents were immigrants from the Azor Islands, so we're Portuguese. Um, I'm number five out of seven kids, good Portuguese Catholic family with no television back then. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and we just, we grew up working on the farm. We grew up dirt poor, literally, um, but didn't know it. We had clean clothes, we had food, and we had a job. Our payment for the job was the clean clothes and the food and a great family life. And, and mom or dad making time to cart us around to baseball or, or football or altar boys or whatever in the heck we were doing. So... This generational thing is really, really important to a lot of us that, that make it to the next generation. And then there's a lot of, a lot of personal pride and personal pressure to see our children succeed to the next generation if they want to. Our, our, and, and so many of our kids and grandkids just don't want to come back to the farm anymore. They've seen what, what their parents or grandparents have gone through to, through the struggles of it all. And they're like, you know what? College life was pretty cool. I met some pretty cool people, a lot of cute girls. Bigger city's pretty nice. Yeah, Dad, I'll see you at Christmas. What's the answer? Well, I wish we knew. But as we go through these droughts and, and, and more problems in, uh, we face with regulations and, and legislations and all those things, it's just a challenge to get our next generation back. And if we want to keep the family farm at 91% of California agriculture, we need to do that. So with that, uh, that's a little bit of my background. I'm partners with my brother and, and, uh, and sister-in-law in our business. Uh, we've been out there for a long time. Um, Director Dick and Director Thomas have been, uh, been to our facility on some tours up there. We love having them. Um, I guess at the end of the day, there, when, when times are tough, farming kind of becomes a, much more of a way of life than it does a living. And um, we love what we do. So anyway, that's a little bit of, uh, of my background. We, uh, we process and market almonds. Uh, we export through, uh, primarily through Port of Oakland because they're closer to us. Um, <laughs> about 70% about of, uh, of our handle is export. The balance is North America. Um, we go through a lot of, a lot of challenges in, in regulations and food safeties and all those things. Uh, but farming and agriculture have been really good the last number of years. And, 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 and I'll, I'll say this, but kind of in closing, that if anybody in farming or agriculture cries poverty over the last few years, they're either a liar or they need to get the hell out of the business. Because farming has been good. And, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, what that means to the rest of the economy in California. But, but farming's been good the last few years. Um, not so good 10 years ago, but, uh, but it's been good now. So with that, again, thank you, and, and uh, I'll be quiet. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Now I'd like to introduce uh, John Chandler. John is a fourth-generation farmer in the Central Valley. 
His family has been farming in Fresno County for over 100 years. Chandler Farms grows peaches, plums, almonds, citrus, and grapes for raisins and wine. John recently returned to the family farm after leaving his job as consultant to the California Senate Committee on Agriculture. As consultant, he analyzed and negotiated amendments and briefed senators on agriculture policy issues and legislation, legislation before the committee. John graduated from Cal Poly San, San Luis Obispo with a bachelor's degree in fruit science. Please welcome John Chandler. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us here come all the way from the Central Valley to talk to you about water. Uh, I know that video that we saw earlier about getting the Colorado River was really interesting. It just shows how tied in you are down here in Southern California to the water issue. Uh, we've been farming, my family, in the Central Valley for over 100 years. Uh, you know, there's a funny story. Uh, we actually have the letter. My great-grandfather came over from Illinois in the dead of winter, and he was riding all over California looking at land, and he was in the Central Valley. And he was having a meal with some friends of his that were out here, and the kids went outside and played. And he said, you know what, if the kids can go outside in December and not have to wear their Mackinac's, this is where we're going to live. So that's how we ended up being where we are. The weeds were high, the ground was good. All we needed to do is get water on it. And luckily, there's been a lot of innovation with irrigation in California uh, to allow that to happen. I myself ended up uh, not going into agriculture right away. I was the fourth, would be and am now, the fourth generation farmer. And I've recently returned after taking a slight detour uh, doing politics and policy. I originally left because I when I graduated college, I looked at agriculture, and at that time, it wasn't doing too well. And there weren't a lot of jobs uh, for recent graduates, and there wasn't space for me on the family farm, so I needed to go out and get another job. And so I did uh, travel around uh, doing some politics policy, but always stayed engaged with agricultural-related issues. And so one day, a couple of years ago, my dad calls me up and says, John, we need you to come back to the farm. I'm getting tired of farming. And so I had to make that choice. Was I going to be one of the 96% that said, nope, let's sell the farm, or was I going to try and be one of the 4% that Paul talks about that is going to come back? Well, I always wanted to go back to the farm, so I made that choice. Sometimes I ask, why did I make that choice? Uh, since I went back to the farm, we've been in a drought, and that's caused a lot of headache. But on the flip side, Farming has been good. What crops we're able to grow with the water we have have been very profitable. And we've been able to, to make an ends meet and grow the farm so that I could come back to the farm and now my brother and his family. And I have some nieces and nephews who hopefully we look at and say maybe they'll be the fifth generation. And I think that's really the goal of every farmer when they have their, their children. And I know for Paul, it, it, with his kids, you look at your kids even when they're just infants, and you say, I hope they're going to be a farmer. It's a great life. I had a very good life growing up on the farm. We get to run around, play with the animals, go out in the fields and eat fresh fruit. As a peach farmer, there's nothing like going out into the field and grabbing a peach that's just a little bit overripe and eating it and watching all that juice squirt out and run down your cheek. It's just a magical experience, and it's worth going back for. But... There's a cloud over all of that economic prof prosperity right now and that success in the valley. And it's this drought that is really kind of the 800-pound gorilla in the room that every farmer, when we go out to our pumps, it used to be we'd go out to our pumps and we'd turn them on and we knew there'd be water. But now we go out to our pumps and we'd turn them on and we pray that there's water. Just yesterday, I was out in one of our fields and we had uh, well drillers and the power company, ours is PG&E, and... Um, we were looking at a pump that's starting to go dry. And once that pump goes dry, we don't have any more water for this field. And it happens to be an almond field, which is a permanent crop. And if we lose that field, it'll take us about four years to get it back up to just beginning to make production again. So we're really working fast to get a, a new well and, and keep water on that field. Unfortunately, with the, the pressures around our area, 
it'll take us about six months to get that pump into production. And maybe not even with power, we might have to su supplement it. So there's that challenge. Uh, there, but that's just on our farm. There's, there's the, the larger scope of uh, the change in how we're receiving our water. Uh, right now, I think within California, from Redding to Bakersfield, agriculture has seen about a 70% decrease in their water allocation, surface water allocations. And so that's pretty significant. And of that, there's about 30% are receiving zero allocation. In our area, we're receiving zero allocation of surface water. Uh, we've had a very historically very good water. I'm in the Kings River, which has been an isolated uh, watershed, but uh, we're, we're not receiving any surface water, and that just puts us even more pressure on our groundwater. But all of that combined puts agriculture in a very tight bind. With all of our prosperity, we're looking very hard to find solutions for this water crisis. And it's, it's coming down and having conversations like this as a state that I think we can look towards finding a solution because while this drought is severe, I do have to have hope. As all farmers, we're gamblers. We, we make our, make or, made or broken on nature, so we have to be gamblers. So I have hope that by working as a larger state, we can punch through and find solutions. And I look forward to a vigorous question and answer period. Thank you. All right, we'll uh, open it up to the audience for questions, but uh, I'd like to start it off. And um, Paul, this, this question's for you. Um, everyone's saying that almonds, not everyone, but we hear a lot that almonds are sucking California dry, that they require, I heard, one gallon for one nut. Can you talk about that, maybe bust, bust some myths for us? So, so much for the softball uh, question. <laughs> <clears throat> Going right in. Get the left hander out of the bullpen yeah. right away. Well, um, the idiot that said an almond takes a gallon of water happens to be in this room, and he's a very dear friend of mine, and he said that here seven years ago. And uh, we had that discussion driving around uh, on the way down. But uh, he, he was right, except he, at that time he didn't finish the sentence um, because there's a whole bunch else that goes into that, that gallon of water, and I'll get to that in a second, but one of, the, one of the main things is that almonds have come under this immense fire from the media of, of, that we're horrible people and, and we're, we're sucking the state dry of all the water. And, and one of the big problems is most of that information that's coming out is inaccurate. I mean, as, as short as two or three days ago, one of your esteemed writers down here in the LA Times put out an article that, that, that is completely wrong in, in its facts. In, in, in one of the early sentences of this article, he states that agriculture consumes 80% of the water. And, and, and that's, that's just not true. Agriculture takes 41%. This year, a little less than that uh, of the water. So, you know, just I guess if you say something enough times, people will, will think it's the truth, but, but we all know that agriculture does not take 80% of the water. Um, also in this article, he, he talks about geographically, you know, legislating geographically where we're going to grow certain commodities and certain, certain crops, and, and specifically almonds, and, and that you know, no almonds should be grown south of Sacramento because it rains more up there than it does in the San Joaquin Valley, and that they can be farmed on, on less water. So I called the, uh, an agronomist up there, leading agronomist in Northern California. He happens to be the, the, the head agronomist for North Valley Ag Services. I said, okay, here, here's the numbers in this article. What, what say you? You're, you're walking... 10,000, 12,000 acres of, of almonds up there. So we went back and forth, and he says, well, certainly in a, in a wet year, uh, yeah, Chico's going to get a lot more rain than, than Fresno. There, there's no question. And, and we could use less water, but what you're missing is 
we'll use a foot or a foot and a half of water just in frost protection up there during bloom time and, and early formation of the nutlets. And that at the end of the day, they're really not using less water in Northern California than we are in the Fresno area. I'm not sure you know, where all the, I mean, he, he, he did state in the article, he had some UC Davis uh, contacts that had given him some of that information. And I mean, to my knowledge, UC Davis isn't growing any almonds in Fresno or Chico. So, you know, I, I don't know. So, so I would just caution you to, you know, to, to do the research when you, when you see these kinds of numbers out there, you know, don't take it at face value. Hell, don't take me at, at, at face value. Do the research on the numbers I'm going to tell you today, please. I, I want you to substantiate it. I want you to feel comfortable that the numbers we're giving you are accurate. Back to this gallon for a kernel. Um, one of the things that's missing out of that formula is the byproducts uh, that are produced from the almond crop. So the almond has the outer hull, the inner shell, and then the kernel. That outer hull is used as livestock feed, uh, primarily into the dairies, and it's a form of roughage. So as an industry, we'll make about 2 million tons of almond hulls that go into livestock feed. On a dry matter basis, which all feed is, is taken back to a dry matter basis, that, that is equivalent to 6 million tons of corn silage. Average yield on corn silage is 30 tons per acre. Average water consumption per acre to grow a 30 ton crop of corn silage is three acre feet per acre. So, the almond industry is actually producing livestock feed with a water value of some 600,000 acre feet. And because you all in Orange County are the best conservers of water, that is equivalent to 1.8 million households per year in Orange County. That's how much water we're saving in the almond industry. I guess that's kind of like when your wife says she went to the store because there was a sale and she saved <laughs> all this money. <clears throat> but, but, but truly, uh, that's 200,000 acres of farmland arable farm ground that would have to be used to produce livestock feed for, for a wonderful, wonderful economic industry, the dairy industry in California. That, you know, that ground can be used for something else, or in a case right now of the droughts, of the two million acres that has zero water allocation, um, you know, it's just not having to, to be farmed. So 1.8 million household in Orange County equivalent. The other thing, a lot of things that we do uh, in, in the almond industry, um, well, furthermore, on the byproducts, we'll also make about 400,000 tons of the inner shell. That shell is gonna go to either livestock bedding or uh, biomass power plants. Um, if it goes into livestock bedding, ultimately it's gonna get blended with manure, or other things to make compost out of and, and will be returned to the soil as a soil amendment. Um, the sticks that come in from the field in, into our huller, sheller, uh, those are, are ground and go to the biomass plants. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things going on there. We're, I mean, we're, we're actually a very, very green industry and, and um, a large number of the, uh, of the the almond processing facilities, hullers and shellers and processors, have gone to solar as a means of their uh, electric supply. Uh, we have a 1.1 megawatt uh, solar array. We generate uh, over 90% of the power that we consume. Um, our, our plastic uh, bin liners, our used ones, are baled and recycled. Uh, and, and, it, and it's very common in, in our industry. So the, so the almond industry is actually very, very green. Um, an almond tree will consume about 1,000 pounds of CO2 per year. 
So, you know, we're cleaning up the air. And, and I'm not going to sit here and, and try to say that we don't have any kind of footprint. I mean, we're, I mean we're, we're moving stuff around, we're fertilizing, we're doing all those things. What I'm trying to say is that, that we get a heck of a lot closer to being neutral than, than most uh, any other industry out there. Uh, so, we, you know, so we feel like we're, we're good stewards of the land and the environment. Um, you know, we're about a $7 billion uh, farm gate industry right now. Farm gate being what the farmer actually gets for the product. Depending on who you talk to, these farm gate dollars are going to turn over seven to eight times. Um, an example of that would be, um, oh heck, let's take the transportation industry. Trucking. Everybody knows about trucking. So we will, the almond industry will have about a $250 million impact on trucking. And that's just, that's not the outlying areas. That's just, that's getting the product from the field to the sheller, the sheller to the processor, the processor to Joel's port. Uh, that's getting all these byproducts, these 2 million tons of, of livestock feed delivered to the dairies. There's 400,000 tons of shell delivered to bedding or to the power plants. $250 million of, of, of uh, economy into California, just in the transportation industry. Most all of the equipment used in the almond industry, and kind of nuts in general, um, short of the tractors, tractors are not built here, but uh, almost all of the implements, uh, certainly all of the harvesting equipment, uh, and the bulk of the processing equipment, um, not only is built in the U.S., but it's built right here in California. So we've got all these wonderful manufacturing jobs in California to build the equipment that supports our industry. So you can see when we talk about these seven to eight time farm gate dollars, uh, it, it's, they're really fairly easy to track. You know, I mean, that doesn't even get down to, you know, all, all of the families that work with us when they go to the store to buy groceries or shoes or, or, or whatnot. So, we're not that bad. <laughs> um, we use, uh, of the 40% of the, of the water that's, um, that's generated uh, in, for agriculture, almonds will consume 8% of that. However, we're farming 10% of the irrigated acres to, to almonds. So if, if, we're, if we're using less than a one-for-one one ratio in this deal, how can, how can we be the bad guys in, in water consumption? And, and again, it's just, it's, you know, perception becomes reality, I guess, if it's said enough times. But, um, you know, but those are facts. And again, please, look them up. I mean, the, 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 that information is available out there. We're, we're, we're farming 10% of the irrigated farmland, and we're using 8% of the ag water. Um, and we're generating an awful lot of jobs and economy for, for the state of California. That was my short answer. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. And uh, there, there is some good news on the almond front. The almond export last year through our port was only down 7% compared to the rest of California ag at 16.5%. And of course, you hear that 90% uh, of the world's almond supply comes from California. So. Yeah. 80%. 80% we Yeah, because of the drought conditions, um, we, have, we, we were at 90 for a long time. We kind of hung in at 85 forever. And uh, actually, the, the, the almond acreage is down about 30,000 acres from last year. Uh, trees that have, uh, that have been abandoned uh, for lack of water because of the drought. And um, our, our production per acre has fallen out for the first time in, in a long time. Our per acre production has fallen off because of the, of the water quality. Um, and uh, it was Stephen that touched on it earlier about you know, the Colorado River, the stuff you guys face down here with the Colorado River water is saltier than what comes through the Delta. What's coming through the Delta just isn't that good right now. Um, and we have, we're seeing pH levels in, in, in the, the mid eights on, uh, on water that's coming through the delta. So these trees have really kind of taken a beating from the salt water and our, our production is actually down. All right, John, we haven't forgotten about you. I got a question for you. Uh, you have great experience on the legislative side. 
is Sacramento helping or hurting farmers, and how active are you in, in pushing them to, uh, to help? Uh, you know, I think Sacramento is trying to help, and they're trying to get their mind around this whole water issue. And it, 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 it's very nebulous, especially for a, a politician that's looking at it uh, a, a, as one of so many different issues. They don't really live water, and how do they understand it in uh, an hour hearing or uh, a 15 minute meeting? And so they're trying to help, so I'm going to give them a little bit of credit on that. but. Sometimes I get very, actually most of the time I get very frustrated with uh, what Sacramento is doing and I kind of wonder, it's like, well, why are they doing that? Um, right now there's some real competition for how, how you handle water and how do you address issues. Uh, one, one issue, there's a, um, a bill right now going through the legislature that's talking about uh, an issue in the delta of, of being able to at least look at and start uh, understanding if maybe some of this endangered species uh, issues is not only related to flows through the delta, but maybe we could look at um, non-native fish species uh, predation on our endangered species. And, that, and that's a bill that's going through the legislature. And for, for someone that's working south of the delta, uh, it's, oh, yeah, it makes perfect sense. We need to look at everything. There's more than just one nail that will build this whole water infrastructure that we're having problems with. But it's having problems in Sacramento. And I think that's where, for me, and I think a lot of people, that's where the frustration comes. We see it from our own perspective. We see it very clearly, and we can't understand well, why are they even debating this? This should be a no-brainer no if we want to find a solution, we need to look at everything. But and then again, politics gets in the way sometimes of good policy. And we need to, as all of us, Southern California, urban, uh, Central Valley, ag, urban, both, everyone working together. So as I said, we need to work together to find a solution. I think that's where we're gonna see, see something going back to Sacramento and forcing the legislature to have common sense and to say, what are our priorities in the state? Because in the end, that's what it's really coming down to. We talked, I mean, the, the article you talked about kind of sets the stage. And they say 80% of the waters for agriculture, right now, that, that's trying to divide out and to allocate out water. And it's setting priorities. So what are our priorities in this state? Uh, right now, our priorities in this state, as Paul mentioned, are 40% agriculture, I think 10% are urban, and 50% environmental. And, and, that, and that's worked for us for a number of years, but now that we're in this tight drought, how are we going to look at that? And are we going to be making adjustments in that? Are we going to shrink ag? Are we going to shr uh, uh, shrink environmental or shrink urban? Or are all they going to get shrink equally, differently? And that's the debate that needs to happen. And, and, and in all honesty, it's a debate that needs to happen here between the interest groups before we take it to Sacramento. Because there's a lot of reaction up there that happens and everyone feels obligated, I need to do something for my constituents, I need to show results, and they need to act fast. Sometimes quick solutions aren't necessarily the best solutions. So how do we have a good conversation? And articles that go out and put inflammatory statements to agriculture that say we need to tell you how to grow, what to grow, where, when to grow, in a very co commanding way is not pushing forward a discussion. As a matter of fact, I look at those as, uh, if you go to a rodeo, there's always, the, the guy gets on the horse and he rides the bucky bronco and when he falls off the bucking bronco, uh, they need, or the bull, I'm sorry, when he falls off the bull, they need something to distract the bull because the bull's ready to go after the cowboy. And so you send out the rodeo clown and the rodeo clown goes out and he distracts the bull and the guys come out and they save the cowboy. Well, when you see articles like that, I look at them as rodeo clowns. They're out there distracting us from finding the true solutions that exist. And we're not gonna find them by just entrenching ourselves in agriculture, entrenching ourselves in Delta only, or north of Delta, south of Delta, over to Hatchby. It doesn't work that way. I mean, we need to look at a message to Sacramento that California's water problem is something that 
all of California needs to come together. We all might take a little bit of a hit, but we need to look at outside issues other than just what are our inflows into a, into a river. Is that going to be what we're going to do to save a, a species? Well, maybe there's something else we need. Let's, let's, let's broaden our horizons and make a bigger tent and, and find a future because if we just rely on Sacramento to come up with a solution, I can guarantee you we're going to be frustrated. Thank you. I'm just going to I'm gonna follow up really quickly on, on one of the things that John pointed out. Um, collaboration, although he didn't use that term, uh, where, where we all need to be working together. Uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, it's water districts uh, up in the valley that, uh, quite frankly, literally have sued each other previously, ha have gotten together, and uh, they've, they've put together 60,000 acre feet to, to move over to the, to the east side of the valley where John farms. Um, to help replenish groundwater for domestic wells and for cities over on the east side where their, their city water um, wells have, uh, have failed. And um, so to John's point about, you know, we, we, we need to find solutions. Uh, I, I think that's it's just a, a very admirable that that group of water districts, I, I, and I'm not sure, I, I just barely got any of the information on the drive down. But uh, I think there were six or seven agencies involved in it that uh, collaborated, that got together um, for the benefit of, of another. And uh, I, I think that's, that, that's kind of landmark. I mean, we've, that's, I mean, from our standpoint, it's wonderful that, that um, those, uh, those agencies were able to work it out for that benefit. I'd like to uh, requote you, if I may, John, and uh, Sacramento needs to have common sense. I'll just throw that out there. Uh, let's take some questions for the audience. We might have time for a couple. Anybody have a question? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, as third and fourth generation farmers, and knowing that we are facing this uh, water shortage into the future, if you had to choose among the, all the crops that you grow, basically to reduce production or take, or take some of the lands out of the production, which one would you take out? If I had to choose a single crop to keep growing or to take or, out? Or multiple crops in order to meet the water supply that you have? When it comes to making our crop, we're making those decisions right now. And uh, I'll tell you one crop that we're going to keep. We're, we have peaches, plums, grapes, and almonds and citrus. Uh, we're starting to take out our stone fruit, some of my favorite crops, but the economics aren't there. We will keep our almonds because they're one of the few crops that can afford the more expensive water. So in some, it's ironic that you know, people talk about almonds as being this, this bad crop, but in reality, you know, farming's economics. I mean, we gotta, make, we gotta make a living as a farmer. I mean, I love the lifestyle, but I can't do it on nothing. I can't, I can't eat air. So uh, I, I, gotta, I gotta look at the crops as economics, and almonds, citrus uh, are, are very good economic models for us to make money on, and that's kind of the direction we're going. Uh, regrettably, we're not producing as much stone fruit, because that's my favorite, but it's reality. Yeah, I think when you talk about, uh, you know, cropping plans, um, you know, we also grow uh, tomatoes, uh, processed tomatoes, and um, we've got 20% of that ranch fallowed this year for lack of water. Um, but. The decision on these permanent crops, you know, obviously are made well in advance and, and they're long term. So, you know, as John says, I mean, it's, it's economics. I mean, farming without economic incentive is called gardening. So. <laughs> um, so we've, so we've, as, as time has gone on over the years, you know, early on, you know, we were farming in general. We were accused of, oh, you've got these low-value crops out there. You're putting all this water on. Okay, so we're not farming wheat and cotton on that land anymore. We're farming high-value uh, vegetables and permanent crops. So, you know, I think that's part of the answer to your question is that we, we uh, agriculture as an industry has moved to the higher valued crops. And, and as John said, that's going to be your, your decision. 
Yes, sir. Uh, we had a, a, we don't have a lot of wells where we're at. Um, we had one that, uh, that failed last August and um, there's been so much demand on, on well driller, or not driller, but pump companies and all that. I'm praying that when I get home tonight, it is, the electricity is back on on that. That's since last August to get that one well. And it was, uh, uh, and we went, we had to go down an additional 40 feet on it. Um, uh, 160 feet. So what we, what we, as, as a, a business decision we've made on our wells, we have a total of three wells that's, that help service the, uh, the row crop operation. Um, we have decided to be good stewards of the land and not drill through the, the Corcoran layer. So all, all of our wells are above that layer. We just, it, I'm going to get off the subject, but I mean, it, it's it, obviously poking holes in the ground is not a long-term solution to what we're doing. However, um, we all have to survive. Um, so we're, you know, we're doing what we have to now. I, uh, where we are, we're, we're a little bit different. Um, we farm a little bit sandier soil. We don't necessarily have um, the issue that uh, Paul's side of the valley has of sus subsidence. Uh, so uh, our water table was pretty historically around 40 feet. And since the drought came on and we stopped getting our surface water, our, we've been dropping about 10 feet each year. Uh, the well that I talked about in my introduction, that well was at 100 feet. And surprisingly, it over the last two years, we've dropped 20 feet since we had had it tested about six months ago and had dropped 20 feet. So and that's where we're having to replace it. Um, new wells that we're drilling, we're going down two to 250 feet. Uh, some parts of the Central Valley, we have some property that we don't farm but lease out. They have wells that they're going down over 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet to get water. And that water is not very good water. It has to be blended. Uh, in order for it to be, even be suitable for the crops. Uh, the important thing to look at is, as I talked about finding solutions, working with our local irrigation districts and working with irrigation districts throughout our watersheds, uh, we've been, this drought has forced us to look at recharge in a whole new and more aggressive light. And as such, we're having conversations as growers with our water districts that those of us that still have some flood irrigation ability, that we are being prepared and, and negotiating that when we do have a flood and a peer event, hopefully, that we will be able to take the excess water and spread it out onto our farms using those older systems and to help, help the system take on more water as a recharge ability, as well as any other recharge basins that the district's already putting in. So that's building that collaborative effort of the growers and the districts working together to find solutions to fix our problems. Because Paul's right, we know it's not sustainable to keep pumping at the rate we are, but we have no choice. Ma'am, you have a question? Thank you. Uh, I visited both of your um, establishments, a fascinating tour, uh, and you've answered some of these questions, but could you just give us an overview, uh, go back 20 years, and tell us the quantity of water that you were dealing with at that time <laughs> and how that has changed along with your management practices over these past years to just yeah. give us an idea of how, how the farming practices have changed as far as management of water. Thank you. Well, I'd like to go back 40 years to start with. So in the, the, the 1977 drought, we had a 25% allocation, water allocation. So on the west side, we've, we've, we've been doing this for 40 years, uh, uh, struggling for allocation and in the federal districts. Um, but yeah, 1977, remember it like yesterday. And the, the difference is, in 1977, we had a 25% allocation. We farmed 25% of the acres. 
um, uh, of the row crop acres. If we had 25% allocation last year or this year, because we had zero last year, zero this year, if we had 25% allocation right now, we'd probably be farming 50% of the land easily, maybe 60% of it. Um, so just through, I mean, like on our tomatoes, I mean, we're growing 60 tons per acre of tomatoes with, you know, 28 inches of water. You know, 20 years ago, they were growing 28 ton, maybe average, maybe 30 at the most, with 48 inches of water. So, um, yeah, we're doing a lot more with a heck of a lot less. And, uh, yeah, right, yeah. We'd, for 25% allocation, we'd be doing cartwheels, that's for sure. But uh, technology, you know, I'll let John talk to some of that. Technology advances. Um, I mean, we all use consultants, you know, water consultants, agronomists, all of that. Um, buried tape on, on row crops, uh, uh, drip lines on permanent crops, all of those things. So technology advances have been substantial. Israel did us a real favor when they helped uh, introduce us into drip irrigation as, a, as a, something on a commercial level. And that, that's really saved a lot of water for agriculture by giving us that idea of uh, hyper-accurate water allocation to each plant. Uh, when, when I was younger, my dad, we usually, he used uh, mostly for irrigation. And yeah, it takes a lot more work. I, when I was a little kid, I'd have to go out and irrigate, and you really had to know what you were doing. You couldn't let that water just shoot down there and go to sleep, and you had to pay attention. Now with the, the, the modern systems, uh, you turn on your pump, and you check, make sure there's no leaks, and you know you're getting the water out there. So it's a lot more accurate. But we've all, uh, agriculture, we, we're innovating constantly. I mean, right now they're utilizing drones, and the, and, and the whole drone industry is starting to see agriculture as a huge potential. We cover a lot of acreage, and drones can do that by looking at how the, what the stress of the plants are, and we can find out where, what areas of the field are getting stressed based on different soil types, or if there's a plug in our irrigation system. Uh, when, my, when I came back and my brother came back to the farm, one of the first things we did is we went out and purchased what's called a pressure bomb. And it's a, it's a, it's a device that you use to, to test how much water the actual plant is needing at that moment. And rather than historically you'd look at what is your soil moisture, how much water you have available in the soil, this goes right from that step into the plant. So now we're looking at where our source, so are we getting the water to the plant, do we, when do we need to irrigate, when do we need to stop irrigating, and, and we're giving the plants a lot more of just the water it needs. And that's showing itself in the increased production. Uh, as we figure out how much water the plant needs, we're not overwatering it and stressing it, and we're not underwatering it and stressing it. We're giving it exactly the nutrients it needs. And, and all of that technology from, from, from drones to the uh, hyper-accurate irrigation systems to um, pressure bombs help us in that. Thank you. I don't want to be between you and your break, so let's thank our panelists one more time. Good job. Thank you.